I was quite impressed by these tracks that I just got sent, In the Wild and also Pale. I think they're really, really something. Maybe you could talk about uh, In the Wild. Yeah, I wrote In the Wild with John Green, who's a fabulous mm -hmm. English uh, producer and songwriter. Um, we were in LA in a studio here, and I'm really interested in cap um, writing songs that are both really vulnerable and emotional but also have a sense of power to them and i think that song does have that uh vulnerability and also that strength right um and it's i you know i like music from uh the 60s 70s 50s you know jazz and soul and blues right. um, but for me it's how can i make it something that sounds fresh and unique and will draw in audiences from today. So it's got, you know, uh, my own kind of stamp to it. So uh, In the Wild is is my efforts in that. Let's talk about just the lyrics and stuff like that first, but you wrote the lyrics or? Yeah. So that's very impressive. So but so you, you wrote all the lyrics and he wrote the music? I think I primarily did the lyrics, but we did it together. We, you know, we edited and, you know, fine tuned the lyrics together. And the production is is John. In LA, you guys did that or not? Yeah, yeah. Great. And is it true you're working in the Foo Fighters studio, or is that? Yeah, I did. I worked at that. Uh, is it Studio One Hundred and One or Two Hundred and Two? Scott. <laughs> I work with a guy called Gan in there who uh, works as a producer from that studio. It's epic. It's uh, it's got all these uh, funny photographs and memorabilia scattered around the place and beautiful grand piano it's a really large lovely space that was fun to work there uh the second track pale was also something good uh can you talk about that was that recorded uh with john as well or that was written uh with a guy called andy stutansky uh he's a great writer i've written a lot with him and we have a great friendship as well uh but pale was written Actually, in a time of grief for me, I lost somebody really close to me, and that was the first song that I wrote uh, after his passing, and it kind of just fell out. It was one that there wasn't much effort or, you know, preconceived ideas to it. The lyrics just kind of flowed out, and you wouldn't know that it's about grief when you listen to it, but you know that it's about some form of emotional breakdown and, you know, seeing the world through... Uh, a cold lens and you know for me it's like pale as the whole world had lost its color had lost its meaning and it lost uh the vitality to it so that, that's where that song came from i hate to rush it because it's a lovely song and it's interesting to hear your um your comments on it so we talk about you know a lot of legacy artists are all older artists but the idea is now to talk to some of you guys and have this kind of dialogue so alternative culture as we go through, or real culture. My observation and question was, Loda, do you think your generation, um, there is this sort of vulnerability, but do you think the reason, um, you know, Ed Sheeran or this very poetic and musical stuff comes around is because maybe people weren't honest or there's a sincerity, a need to be vulnerable or to be real. I think, I think we're living in a time where the people are more emotionally, not, I don't want to say more emotionally intelligent, but there's more information or, and dialogue on emotional intelligence than there's ever been before. Uh, and kind of having a, a connection to your inner voice. I think the internet, you know, allows people to have uh, a connection to you know, something maybe that they want to explore that's deeper than just the what's cool or what's, you know, a sort of image they're trying to um, right. uh, prove. I think people uh, are, are more willing to be open. Um, and I think it's important that people are open about how they're feeling inside because, you know, especially if you're lucky enough to have a, a creative uh uh, something that you're creative and you can channel that through because you know if people don't talk about issues or feelings that they're going through it can be hugely detrimental so I think for people to be able to have a dialogue and just be open about whatever it is they may be going through like that's super healing and that's super uh it's fundamental really to get through to have a happy life I think people respond to that in music because uh you know music is something that connects those feelings together and it, 
that's always been the case, I think. I think music's been vulnerable. Uh, you know, we talk about Etta James, that's incredibly vulnerable. We talk about Nina Simone, you know. I think, I think sure. music is such a vulnerable thing. Do you remember the first song you just got, wow, that's sort of cool. Um, there's a few different songs that really drew me in, but I remember when I was about eight, we had Lauren Hill on, I think it was CD or maybe it was tape. And it was the um, Miseducation of Lauren Hill, that incredible timeless album. Right. And I remember just putting it on and I had a notepad and paper and I'd rewind. It wasn't, this was pre YouTube, pre any sort of lyrics on Google. And I'd rewind every line that she did and write down the lines of the lyrics so that I could learn her songs. And I just was completely captivated by the emotion in her voice and the sounds that were coming out of that record and you know I still am every every I probably listen to it once a month or something now because right. it's just it, it it evolves as you evolve oh what about Edda James what is your favorite can you name a couple you like that you really love? I mean it's a classic uh but at last is just the most beautiful song I think the delivery and the intonation and the tones in her singing is just so raw, so emotive. Um, yeah. I always will love that song. Every, every singer loves that song. <laughs> I see Lauren Hill as an evolution of Etta James and maybe not Dusty Springfield, but from those soul eras, you know, she's a 90s hip hop take on soul singing to me. So I, I, see, I see the connection between all those artists. And a Dusty, what about a Dusty track? Oh, so many ones that I love. Um, Son of a Preacher, Take Another Little Piece of My Heart, uh, Spooky, that kind of 60s, loungy feeling. Uh, Dusty, for me, is just the queen of blue-eyed soul and captivating that uh, just cool 60s sound. And her voice is so effortless and it's so light in moments and so powerful in other moments. Did you rebel at all? I had, yeah, I, I, I would say I had a bit of a rebellious phase when I, I went to Royal Academy of Music um, to sing opera, that, which, which was kind of a course I fell into. I did the audition just because I wanted to have the experience of training for an audition because I always did opera as a kid as well, like as well as jazz and soul. That was yeah. a style of singing that I really loved to do. And then I got into Royal Academy and it was such a, it was like such a compliment. I was so happy to get in, but I knew it was all wrong for me because I wanted to be an artist to write my own music. So uh, I was only there for about six months and after about six months I quit and I definitely had some fun during that period of just, I was uh, 18 or 19 and I uh, lived with some friends in East London and you know, I, I, I like, when I was younger, I when I was in my early 20s, I, I liked fun. <laughs> but that, you know, I liked having stories and I liked having things to write about and I liked living life. And, and mum kind of let you go through those periods or she? I was never doing anything bad. Because these rock stars, I grew up with Hendrix and the Stones and these people. That, so it's interesting to see how parents react. So um, there's a bit of Dave Stewart on your social. Do you guys, is he a god? What's the relationship with them? He sounds like a sweet guy. Or... Yeah, Dave's great. Um, he lives over the hill. Uh, from where I live and he's got kids my age who are all doing music too and yeah we have a, a good friendship with him. Okay great lovely so but not a not a godfather or anything like that? No he's not I don't actually have any godparents. That's interesting okay. What was your first car? Uh, <laughs> it was a PT Cruiser the ultimate mum car for a 21 year old. No that's trouble come on <laughs> a blonde bombshell in him. PT Cruiser, that's a story. But now I have a Prius because I like to be uh, friendly, environmentally friendly. So I drive around in a hybrid. Three LA. Yeah. Did you pass your test? I did pass my test, yeah. First time? Uh, in LA, first time. In, in England, I'm, you don't want to know. <laughs> but now I'm a good driver. <laughs> Tell us. That was a period of, of trial <laughs> and tribulation, passing my driving test, but I got there in the end. Um, okay. Do you still model? No. Did you like modeling? I dipped my toe in modeling. Um, you know, for me, music has always been like such a passion for me and such a love. And I just, I always wanted to pursue that fundamentally. And, you know, if anything came out of modeling later, um, 
I'd be happy to do it. But yeah, I enjoyed the bits of modeling that I did uh, when I was younger. It was it was fun. It was a different world, and yeah. Okay. And did your mum sit you down for a good talk? Talk about you know, I don't know, warning or did you find it just a young girl's dream? Was it abusive? Was it everything was cool? I mean, I knew I wanted to do to be a singer since I was eight. Like it's just the thing that I love most. Um, I think there is a protective element of her initially when I was younger and I, you know, saying this is what I wanted to do. But, you know, she really saw in me that it's such a love and it makes me so happy. And she's been really supportive and we have great conversations about musicality and artists. And Now, I was talking more about modelling, but... Uh, oh, modelling. Did she oh, sit you down uh, and say, look, if anyone comes on to you, send them true to me? Oh... Uh, uh, she kind of just let me do my thing. Wow. Okay, very cool. Yeah. And Dad was okay with it, or you know, she was protective and and careful with it. But but we had uh, we had agents that you know they were putting me in very trusted hands. It was all the people they'd worked with, and they it was a trust. It was a trusting environment. It sounds like your mum was pretty good at letting you guys you know develop into yourself. And my mum's always been good at. Uh, she lets me and my sister. She doesn't overimpose, and she's she's she lets us uh, she trusts us, and she lets us do our thing. So. And mum kind of let you go through those periods, or she within she boundaries. Too... You know, it was she trusted us, but within reason, and with and she gave us you know safe boundaries. So. Okay, so uh, you're working with Roger from XIX. Yeah. Uh, I guess that he seems like a great bloke, and you know, can you tell us anything about those guys? I mean, I've been working with XIX, which is uh, owned by Simon Fuller, since I moved to LA about four years ago. Um, and they really took me under their wing, and they put me in a lot of writing sessions with different writers and producers, uh, and really helped me develop and find my style and just get as much writing experience as possible. Um, you know, we've been doing gigs with them uh, and uh, traveling around, and now my single's coming out soon. So I'm, I'm really excited to, because I've been doing music for so long, so I'm so excited to finally share something with, with people after all these years of experience, like writing and developing. I, I'm kind of interested. I'm kind of looking forward to it. Because uh, it's, it's kind of my, I get the sense that they're letting you, uh, again, this organic, letting the, pro, you know, the project sort of grow organically. He's thinking Definitely. long term, is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think building a strong foundation so that you really, like, know yourself as a writer, know who you are as an artist, um, and just have as much musical experience before you start putting yourself out there, which is a different method to, I'd say, most people these days. But for me, it's been, uh, it's been really good to do that because I, I feel uh, like I know myself and right. I feel ready. I think people know a lot about Serengeti. Is it Will? Will you're... Gregory. Did you, is yeah. he producing it? Yeah, Will Gregory is the composer and the producer. He did all the music. Uh, the so I it. Okay. Um, so I got together in Will Gregory's studio with him, uh, and we had certain animals that we needed to write kind of motifs for, right. uh, and we had to kind of consider the story and the context of each animal, what they were going through on the screen. And also just the the feeling of that animal as itself, you know, a lion, you know, it has those tr traditional lion qualities, but in this uh, show, the lion's actually, the female lion's outcast from her pride. So she's actually being quite vulnerable and like desperate. She has these cubs that she has to feed. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to really uh, dig into the unique story of each creature rather than just the broad sweeping um, take on them as an animal and really pull out the their individual stories mm -hmm. um and i i think the emotion of each creature is is highlighted through the music so a few quick ones we we opened up with the, the golden stone years event uh how did you get dragged into that so i actually made a acoustic video at home of a song of the trc song waterfalls that i did a cover of it and uh, I posted it on social media and they got back to me and uh, said that they'd like me to, they saw the song and they asked me if I'd like to perform there. It's a beautiful rendition. Actually, I did watch Thank that. You. But that is, you know, that is, I heard the, the new production stuff uh, 
actually Roger just sent me in and, and I really didn't it's a very different level I mean you're you know the new stuff that was just me tinkering around on my piano <laughs> no but it was it was yeah, lovely it was... but also interesting that it was just a social media thing there was no big connection between Donovan or, or your mum no. you put the camera up there shot it and ended up at this event so yeah what does that say to everyone just like to yeah. do, use it or you know work it and um, put yourself out there okay what was the schedule like you flew over there from LA because you're LA now and... yeah I flew there from LA spent a day in London no two days in London we did a rehearsal with the band and I will say like their band was amazing like working with those musicians was oof the drummer like when we were playing and I could he was behind me I could just literally feel the drums like that's how it should um, be and he was for the Simple Minds drummer is that right oh really I didn't know that yeah and then the next day, I we drove on coach uh, to to the set uh, to the venue and did you know some interviews, a rehearsal, and at that point as well, I'd uh, literally had no sleep because I was so jet lagged. So I remember doing the rehearsal on about two hours sleep, and I was just like. Wow, I was just going through the motions and just enjoying it. Um, luckily, I had good sleep that night, and the next day I felt great and really excited for the show. You sang uh, All the Lonely People or Eleanor Rigby? Eleanor Rigby, yeah. We saw a bit of that. That sounded lovely. All the choir and everything. Maybe the MD uh, did this cool uh, string arrangement for it. He said it was almost like it ended up sounding like Foo Fighters' take on Eleanor Rigby, which was this powerful kind of sound. Uh, and yeah, the choir were beautiful. We'd, I'd never got to rehearse with them, so it was what you were seeing was the first time mm. together, but all, all their lines were so beautiful, so it was, it was nice. It sounds like they did a good job. Um, they did. What, what about the, did you sing any of your songs? No, I just sang uh, Rolling Stones and the Beatles. Okay, what was the Stones one? Uh, She's a Rainbow, and actually I sang Everybody Needs Somebody to Love, which is actually Solomon Burke originally, but they Stones covered it. And obviously everyone knows it from the Blues Brothers. Was that ensemble or just you? Uh, that, was, that was everyone, but not the choir. Uh, any other highlights from there before we, did you, was it fun to sing with Donovan and Mike Scott? And I mean. Oh, I didn't sing with them. I, I just sang. <laughs> no, no, I didn't sing with them. I sang with the band and the choir. Okay. But was yeah. it a good experience? Any other highlights from the memorable? It was so fun. Yeah, I just think people watching, seeing all these like epic rock legends hanging out and doing their thing on stage was really fun to see. Um, and also just people watching the audience. You know, there was people there who, you know, had a good time in the 70s and they were dressed up to the nines and they were in their 70s now and it, they looked so cool. I loved that. Great. Kind of interesting, the intergenerational thing maybe too? Sorry? The intergenerational thing is they had some younger artists. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was a great idea to do that because everyone loves the Stones. Like, who doesn't? So to have those people uh, who are younger artists and artists from that time, I think was a really cool move. And I'm grateful. Okay, well, that's lovely. I think, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. Anything else you want to just let us know? I think, I think that's good. If you wouldn't mind putting in the, the In the Wild that it's coming out, because that's what I'm working towards now and looking I absolutely will because I, I actually you. love the track so pleasure nice interview and uh, also actually good music that was so, fun <laughs> okay thanks so much